Welcome to lecture number 25 for ECE 341, Random Processes. In this lecture, we look at the chi-squared test. Now, a chi-squared test is a test to see if your data is consistent with an assumed distribution. It can be used to test whether a die is fair, meaning each number has equal, like, equal probability, or whether a certain number is coming up more often than it should. It can test a roulette wheel. Is a roulette wheel fair, or some numbers coming up more than they should? I can also test whether a distribution is normal, or Poisson, or geometric, stuff like that. A chi-squared test is a type of a gamma distribution. What you're doing is comparing the data versus the mean squared. That'd be a gamma distribution. So it, let's start out with a, a, a six-sided die. With a six-sided die, each number comes up equally fair, equally likely. And this actually has applications to places like casinos. Uh, for example, this is the game of craps. What you do in craps is you roll dice. So here they're clearing out the table. People are placing their bets on numbers. They eventually give the shooter uh, two dice. The shooter then rolls the dice, and based upon the number that comes up, uh, you win or lose. On the first roll, if you roll a 7 or 11, you win. 2, 3, or 12 is craps, you lose. On any other number, it's a point. If you get a point, you start rolling the dice, and if you get that number before you get 7 or 11, you win. If you get 7 or 11 before you get your point, you lose. In the meantime, people are betting on numbers like 10, 9, 8. While you're rolling the dice, if a 10 comes up before the game is over, you win. So that's kind of the idea behind craps. And if you watch kind of how they play the game, here the pit boss is shooting the dice over to the player. The player picks two dice. Okay, trying this again. They toss the dice over to a player. Player picks two of the dice. Then they throw the dice and watch where the dice hit. Throw the dice, hits the back wall, and they bounce off. There's a really interesting book I read back in junior high about cheating and craps. Well, a long time back, somebody figured out a way they would take the two dice, take the bottom die, make it a six. Take the dice and throw them. The bottom dice, they throw them with a lot of spin on it. The bottom die would just roll, it would just slide, and always come up six, and the other die would roll. If you know one of the dice is always going to be a six, that's going to affect the odds, and people start winning. So the casinos changed the rules. You now have to hit the back wall. Well, somebody else came along with an idea. They would take the dice, cup them, get the bottom die to be a six, throw it against the back wall, so it just nails that corner right there. Top die would roll off, the bottom die would just stick. Well, the bottom die is always a six, that affects the odds. So now what casinos do is when you roll the dice, they have to hit like three inches above the bottom of the board and bounce off. Let's get them to roll the dice again. You can watch when they throw them. Shoot the dice over to them, tosses the dice, hits the back wall, bounces off. There's your number. Well, even with that, you can still cheat. You can go on eBay and buy loaded dice. So these are loaded dice you can buy on eBay. What they do is they drill out the, the pips on the sixes and fill them with lead and then cover them up and paint them. So the six is extra heavy. That way the six tends to wind up being down and the one comes up more often than it should. Uh, to fix that, what casinos went to is clear dice. So you can still load the dice. You just can't be so flagrant about it. Um, and in addition, they will re you know, circulate the dice, take them out of uh, play. If you ever cup your hands, like going back to the match, if you ever cup the dice in your hands so that the casino can't see them, they get really upset. Uh, they think you're trying to switch the dice on them. If the dice falls on the floor, they get upset, retire those dice, break out some new ones. Even with that, they retire the dice after every 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and then, even at, with all those precautions, at the end of the day, they check the bin of the retired dice. There's always a whole bunch of loaded dice in there. 
So that's kind of cheating in craps. You get the same thing in roulette. In roulette, the way roulette is played, you've got this wheel of 32 numbers. And what they do is the dealer releases a marble on the wheel, opposite direction the wheel is spinning. Marble spins around, eventually lands on a number. 32 red. If you bet on 32 red, you win. If you bet on a different number, you lose. You can also bet even odd uh, red versus black. You know, various ways to bet. So again, they spin the wheel, spin the marble the opposite direction. Eventually, the marble lands somewhere. That's the winning number. Well, are all numbers equally likely? Ideally, yes, but roulette wheels are not perfect. Do some numbers come up more often than they should? And actually, the answer is yes. Um, there was somebody a couple years ago that was actually making money off of this, found out that roulette wheels are not perfect. So the way they combat that is roulette wheels, at the end of the day, they take all the roulette wheels, put them in a covered or con concealed room, locked room, shuffle the wheels around, bring them out, so you don't know which wheel is on which table each day. If you touch the wheel, casinos get really upset. It's like you're trying to mark the wheel, trying to know which one to bet on. Um, they get really upset if you do that. If you sit there and start collecting data, uh, they get upset too. But still, it opens up the problem. I've got a roulette wheel. Ideally, all numbers are equally likely. Is that so? How do I test that? That is a chi-squared test. For example, in MATLAB, I can roll a six-sided die with the following code. RAND is the number between 0 and 1. 6 times RAND is between 0 and 6. Round up gives you numbers between 1 and 6. That's your six-sided die. Are e all numbers equally likely? Well, to run a chi-squared test, you do the following. First, you split the data into m bins. It's got to be at least two. Uh, one bin kind of makes no sense because what that says, I rolled the dice 10 times, I came up with 10 numbers. What do I know? You need at least two bins, even, odd, one, non-one. You need at least two bins. So split the data into m bins. Uh, for example, I could do, do the numbers 1 through 6, or in this, yeah, this would be the numbers 1 through 6. I then collect some data. Um, count how many times the data fell into each bin, and then compute the chi-squared score. This is the expected number of times the data comes up in each bin, minus the actual number of times squared, divided by the expected number of times. Add them all up for all bins. Once I get my chi-squared value, I convert that to a probability using a chi-squared table. So, let's try that. Here's the data for rolling a six-sided die in MATLAB. Let's roll a six-sided die 120 times. So what this code does is I start out with a result is zeros of 1, 6. You know, start out with 0, 1s, 0, 2s, 0, 3s, and so on. I roll the die. If I rolled a 3, increment the counter for 3 by 1. If I roll a 6, increment that counter by 1. Repeat 120 times. When I'm done, here's what I got. Here is the frequency. I have 18 1s, 27 2s, 25 3s, 19 4s, 14 17 6s. Is this a fair die? Well, what a chi-squared score does is I compare the expected frequency. If I have a fair die, each number has a 1 in 6 chance of coming up. Times 120 gives you, I should get 21s, 22s, 23s, and so on. Take the difference squared. So this is 2 squared divided by 20, 7 squared divided by 20, 5 squared divided by 20, and so on. Add them all up, I get a chi-squared score of 6.2. Now to convert that to a probability, I use a chi-squared table. What a chi-squared table looks like is this. I've got the degrees of freedom. This is the number of bins minus 1. Uh, essentially need at least two bins. A single bin just says, I rolled the dice 120 times, 120 numbers came up. What do I know? Well, absolutely nothing. I need at least two bins, even odd. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here I've got 6 bins, meaning 5 degrees of freedom. My chi-squared score was 6.2. So I look for 6.2 on the table, and it's right around here, between 10% and 90%. 
and that tells me the probability. So a table is one way to look at it. What the table tells you is if I have a really large number, that means that the data is inconsistent with the distribution. I can be like 99.5% certain that this is not a fair die. If I have a really low score, this says the data is exceedingly consistent with the distribution. In fact, so good, I am suspicious the data was fudged. A number in the middle is typically what you get. I can't reject the null hypothesis that this is a fair die. I can't claim that I fudged the data. No conclusion. That's very common. So I can use a chi-squared table. Or I can use StatTrack. Go to StatTrack.com kind of a statistician's playground. Go to chi-squared table. I've got five degrees of freedom. Chi-squared score is 6.2. Evaluate, and it comes up with a probability, 71%. So based upon this, I'm 71% certain this is not a fair die. That's basically no conclusion. MATLAB is pretty well debugged. Its RAND function is pretty good. If I repeat with uh, a million rolls, these are my results. Find the chi-squared score. This is these results. The expected value is one-sixth times a million. Divided by expected value, add them all up. There's my chi-squared score. This corresponds to probability of 37%. Again, that's very typical. It's not real big like 99%. It's not real small, like 0.1%. It's right in the middle. That just means no conclusion. I've got no reason to claim that this is a loaded die. No reason to claim I fudged the data. That's a chi-squared test. Now, example two. Suppose I had a loaded die. So what I'm going to do is 10% of the time, I always roll a six. The rest of the time, it's a fair die. Can I tell whether that die is loaded if I roll the dice a thousand times? No. 120 times. So here's my result. Um, well, to determine whether that's a loaded die, do the same procedure. I'll set up this table. Here's the expected frequency. Here's the actual frequency. Take the difference squared divided by expected, add them all up, I get 11.5. To determine what 11.5 means, use a chi-squared table. So five degrees of freedom, 11.5 is right around here. So I'm 95% certain that this is a loaded die. If I repeat for 1,200 rolls, these are my results. Take the Find the chi-squared chi score, another way to do it in MATLAB, it's 68. 68 is a huge number. Again, 16.75 is 99.5. I'm way over at 68. With 1,200 rolls, just about guaranteed, this is a loaded die. Um, of course, if I'm playing craps and I rolled the dice 1,200 times, I know why I'm losing. I'm also broke at that point, but at least I know why I'm broke. So with the chi-square test, I can spot 10% loading if I have enough data. With just a limited amount of data, it's like 120 rolls, which is still a lot of rolls. I'm only, what was that? Well, still 95% certain. That's a 10% loading. So with the chi-square test, I can detect whether dice are loaded, but I need data, and sometimes need a lot of data. Kind of a neat feature of loaded dice, or chi-square test, I can tell you how much, how loaded you can make the dice. <coughs> the application of that would be like the imitation game. <coughs> this is a movie where they talk about Alan Turing. He cracked the German Enigma code back in World War II. Again, good movie, highly recommended, but here's the problem. Uh, they cracked the German Enigma code, so they knew when the Germans were going to bomb cities, they knew where their U-boats were going. What do you do? 
If I respond to every German message, very quickly the Germans will realize I told the submarines go here, there was a British destroyer there to meet it. Send another message, again the British respond right away. If we respond to every message, I, the Germans will quickly catch on that they, we cracked the code. If you never respond, then there's no point in cracking the code. How often can you respond without the Germans realizing that you know what they're doing? That's the imitation game, and they're using statistics in that movie. Those statistics are chi-squared tests. Same thing we're looking at here. Exactly the same problem is I've got a six-sided die. I want to load it. How loaded can I get away with? Again, if the loading is 0%, um, I'm not going to get caught because I'm not cheating. Load it 100% of the time, so I always roll a 6, 6, 6. Pretty quickly you're going to catch on the die 6 that is loaded. How loaded can I make it and have the person not being able to tell that I loaded the die? So I first have to make a couple of assumptions. Let's define the probability of detection to be 5% or 95%. Let's define the number of rolls to be 120. Well, 95% corresponds to 11.1 .1 for chi-squared score. Let's assume I have x too many sixes, and the x's are stolen from the other numbers. I steal the same number from each other number, x over 5. Okay, that's a lot of assumptions, but it lets me do some calculations. So, if I roll the dice 120 times, I should get 20 ones, twos, threes, and so on. I have 20 plus x. I have x too many sixes. The other numbers are short by x over 5. Now let's calculate the chi-squared score. Take the difference squared divided by 20, difference squared divided by 20, difference squared divided by 20, add them all up. I get 1.2x squared over 20. If this is 11.5, then I'm 95% certain this is a loaded die. Solve for x. That works out to x is 13.84, or 13.84 out of 120. I can load the dice 11% of the time. So 11% of the time, I get a 6, no matter what. The rest of the time, it's fair. With 11% loading, it's pretty hard to detect with only 120 rolls. With enough rolls, I can get away with it. That's one use of chi-squared test. I can see how blatantly I can cheat and get away with it. Or, if I'm worrying about German subs in World War II, how many times I can respond to a German message without the Germans realizing we cracked the code. So now when you watch the imitation game, you can know what they're talking about. Another thing you can do with the chi-square test, I can detect whether you fudge your data or not. A large chi-square score over here means the data is inconsistent with your distribution. A really small chi-squared score, like over here, says you got either really, really lucky or you fudged your data. Um, so, for example, suppose instead of rolling a fair die 1,000 times, I decide to cheat. I'm kind of lazy, so what I'm going to do is I'm only going to roll the dice 100 times, then add 150 to the total. That way it looks like I rolled the dice 1,000 times, but I didn't. Well, a chi-squared score will detect that the data fits the, the distribution too well. In MATLAB, what I'll do is I'll roll 150 dice. I'll count the frequency for each one. And then I will... Or actually, I'm going to roll 100 dice, then add 150 to each number. So when I do that, here's what it looks like. I got 168 ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. So it kind of looks okay. Each numbers are different. Might be roll dice. If I do the chi-squared test, take the difference squared divided by 166, add them all up, I get 0.44. From a chi-squared test, a 0.44 means the probability is 0.5%. So the odds are 201 against me getting data this good. Uh, so again, chi-square test can test can detect whether data was fudged. An example of that is Mendel. Mendel did studies on peas showing genetics. You've got a dominant gene and a recessive gene. And if I have a hybrid, a dominant plus recessive crossed with a hybrid, dominant and recessive, I will get a dominant gene three times. So these are all the combinations. So 
So this would be like a green pea, this would be a yellow pea. The yellow peas will only be one fourth of the time. Uh, green pea will be three fourths. The way Mendel did it is he took a, uh, a pea, crossed it eight times. In the first generation, take out the green, he only used the green ones, cross again, cross again, repeat eight times, call that a purebred. But when you do that, there's still a couple of recessive genes in there. That data never showed up, or those recessive genes never showed up in his data. The data was too good. And you can show with the chi-square test that he got lucky way too often. So he basically Mendel fudged the data. Um, his defense was that, well, it should be three-fourths, one-fourth ratio. If it didn't come up with that ratio exactly, people wouldn't believe him, and he was right. So uh, this way he convinced people of a fact that was true. Well, forcing the data that your theory isn't how you're supposed to collect data. But anyway, that's one thing you can do with the chi-square test. You can spot fudging data. Chi-square tests also work with continuous distributions, not just dice. Um, well, actually, kind of let's back up for a sec. With die rolls, the bins are actually kind of arbitrary. Here, I chose the bins to be one, two, three, four, five, six separate bins. I could group them. I could say this is one bin, one, two, three. Here's another bin, four, five, six. I could choose a different combination. I could say this has been the first bin. All those are the second bin. You know, many ways to group the data. This is also where you kind of have to watch who's funding the, the study. If there's many ways to analyze the data, uh, some ways will give the answer that I want. Some ways will give the answer that I don't want. Depending upon who's funding the study, uh, I might be financially inclined to give the, the customer the answer that they want rather than what the data says. There's many ways to analyze this. This means you can kind of pick and choose which way you want to analyze. That's why when you see a study, it's important to watch or look at who funded the study. Uh, that kind of biases the results for what it, the sponsor wants to see. So anyway, where are we at? Okay, so that's discrete distributions. Chi-squared also works with continuous distributions. With a continuous distribution, what you do is, again, you split the data into bins. In this case, if I have a normal distribution, I'll split it up into eight regions. So here's uh, three standard deviations left, three standard deviations right, between two and three, one and two, and so on. There's my eight regions. Next, I'll collect a bunch of data, then see how many times the data falls into each region. I'll then compare the frequency the data falls into each region divided compared to the expected frequency, the probability times the sample size, your n times p, calculate the chi-squared score, and then convert back to a probability. So let's try that. Now this is something we talked about earlier. If I have a uniform distribution, I can approximate a normal distribution by adding up 12 uniform distributions. For example, if I have a uniform distribution over the range of 0 to 1, that's the RAND function MATLAB, it has a mean of a half and a variance of 1 12th. If I add up 12 of them, the mean becomes 6 times that, become, or 12 times that, becomes 6. The variance becomes 12 times that, 1. So take the sum of 12 uniform distributions, subtract 6. This, from the central limit theorem, is a bell-shaped curve. Kind of looks like a normal distribution. The mean is 6 minus 6, or 0, and the variance is 1. That almost looks like a normal distribution with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. Let's use a chi-square test to see, is that a normal distribution? And this is a trick they do in computers fairly often. Uh, uniform distribution is easy to generate. If I just take the time that I hit a button, time just keeps on wrapping around over and over again, uniform distribution. So uniform distributions are very easy to generate. Normal is a little bit harder. Well, if I take 12 uniform distributions, add them up, subtract 6, call that a normal distribution. 
Well, if I wanted to tell whether that's normal or not, what I could do is look at the source code. If I see this in the source code, I can say, nope, that is not a normal distribution. And I know that because this goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. This can never be, go bigger than 6. It can never get smaller than minus 6. So it is not normal. If I don't have access to the source code, it's a lot harder. But I can use chi-squared table or chi-squared test. So let's do that. Let's generate 100 numbers using this and determine, is this a normal distribution? So here what I'm doing, I'm generating 100 numbers, uh, adding to it add 12 random numbers, minus 6, stack them all together, then count. How many times is it in the, re in the bin less than 3? How many times in this bin? So on. This is n. So there's the frequency, 0, 2, 14, 30, 42, 13, 0, 0. The probability of each bin. This is a normal distribution. I just used a normal table or stat track. Uh, the CDF or probability for tail at minus three standard deviations is 0 0.001. Two versus three, the difference becomes 0 0.0222. One minus one to minus two, 0.136. Zero to one, 0.341, and so on. Once I know P, I know N times P. P times 100 is how many times these numbers should come up. I can now form a chi-squared table. So here's the bins. That's your bell-shaped curve. Here's P. Here's N times P. This is what I actually measured. Now form the chi-squared score. 0 minus 0 0.1 squared over 0 0.1. 2.2 minus 2 squared over 2.2. Add them all up. 4.79. That's my chi-squared score. Convert that to a probability using StatTrack. Again, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 bins, meaning 7 degrees of freedom. Uh, that corresponds to a probability of 0.31. So 31%, again, that's a typical number. It's not real small, saying I didn't fudge the data. It's not real big, saying I can reject the null hypothesis, meaning it's not a normal distribution. Somewhere in the middle, no conclusion. So with the 100 data points, I can't tell the difference between this function and an actual normal distribution. Let's repeat with 100,000 data points. 100,000 data points, p stays the same. Here's n times p. Here's the actual n. Difference squared, divide by np. Add all up, I get 36. 36 corresponds to probability of 99.95%. So I'm 99.95% certain that this is not a normal distribution. But to conclude that, I needed 100,000 numbers. Again, if this is a casino, I'm probably broke by the time I bet 100,000 times. There is a difference, but it's pretty hard to tell. So likewise, it's not a bad approximation. Another thing to note is where the information lies. The numbers in the middle aren't all that bad. It's the tails. The tails tell you whether the distributions are correct or not. And again, that kind of makes sense because my function, six normal distributions, or add 12 uniform distributions minus six, that is actually limited. I'll never get a number less than minus six. I'll never get a number bigger than plus six. So this part of the curve is always zero versus the normal distribution it's small but it's not zero i should see some numbers out there eventually no matter how many times i roll the dice with the function that i'm using i will never ever get a number bigger than six never ever get a number smaller than minus six that's where you can tell that this is not a normal distribution so that's kind of a chi-squared test uh, with a chi-squared test, I can test whether a die is loaded or not. I can test whether a distribution is normal or not. Um, I can calculate how loaded I can make a die and get away with it. I can tell whether data has been fudged. So it's a pretty useful test. Again, basically, chi-squared test is a test of a distribution. 
what we'll look at on the next lecture would be some examples of the chi-square test. So that's lecture number 25 for ECE 341.